Today I've got the T-Motor Velox F7 SE flight controller and BL Heli 32 50 amp ESC stack. I just finished a brand new build with this stack and the T-Motor Velox V3 motors. It's flying great. I'm gonna give you an overview of some of this stack's features and talk you through the build process. As a full disclosure, T-Motor did provide the stack and the motors, but they've had no editorial input into this review. We have an F722 flight controller with switchable BECs, an ICM42688P gyro, 128 megabytes of black box storage, analog and HD are supported. Additional features include a barometer, wireless Bluetooth connectivity. There's six ports and most of them are addressable by pads or through connectors under the board. The onboard BEC offers 5V and 10V at 1.5 amps, and it also offers a pit mode. Now, the pit mode directly ties into the Betaflight VTX pit mode function, which allows you to turn power directly to your video transmitter on and off. I think this is a pretty cool feature because there are some video transmitters that get really hot, even in standby mode. The walk snail is one of them, and just to be able to turn that off is pretty nice. Another useful case for VTX pit mode is GPS related. You can wait for the max amount of satellites to be acquired, keeping your VTX off, preventing overheating, but also eliminating any GPS interference it may have while downloading satellite data. It has a wireless Bluetooth module, which is awesome for using the SpeedyB app to change settings right from your phone. But there's a really big problem. It only works with Android. It doesn't work with iOS. The flight controller will appear in the SpeedyB app under the unknown devices list, and it will connect on Android. It won't connect on iPhone. Now, if you do have an Android phone or tablet, though, enjoy it because the SpeedyB app is a super convenient program to change or modify settings out in the field without having to drag a computer out there. One last thing to use the SpeedyB feature, you've got to have MSP enabled on UART 6, and yes, it does take up this port. The ESC in the stack is a 6S 50 amp with 60 amp burstable 4-in-1 ESC with BL Heli 32. The ESC that I received had genuine BL Heli firmware on 32.9. The only change that I made was to lock the PWM frequency to 48 kilohertz. As many know, BL Heli is not functional as a company anymore, so you will not be able to update firmware or reflash this ESC. Let's get set up for the build. So in the package, this is what you get, a capacitor, an XT60 cable, plenty of gummies, both short and tall, and connectors. Now I'm using the TBS Source 1 V4 or HD frame. We're not gonna go into the full frame assembly. Uh, and I just want you to follow this video, generally speaking. You could apply this to any five inch build. I'm gonna be using Walk Snail and Express LRS for my receiver and the T-Motor Velox motors as well, the V3. With the frame and motor set, we're ready to start working on the stack. The kit comes with two kinds of cables. The first one is this do-it-yourself cable with the individual pins and sockets so that if you have a foreign ESC, then you could build the right pin out that goes to the flight controller. But since we have the stack, the easiest thing to do is just use the included plug and play connector. Now I didn't because I thought I had misplaced mine, so I built my own. Either way, side by side, here's a freeze frame for your reference. This is how it should be, and we're ready to move on. Going to solder the XT60 cable and the included capacitor. Now, for this particular frame, I kind of just like to put it on the stack, ex measure out where about where I want it to be, and then go from there. So I put tape over all my ESCs and electronics whenever I'm soldering. I don't always remember to do that, but I think it's a good tip to keep solder splatter off. I'm using the pine sole soldering iron and some 6337 solder from Kester, which makes this really easy. And I put the capacitor on the bottom. I keep the XT60 on top. Okay, so I have the XT60 going in the direction that I want it to, and I'm gonna end up just zip tying it right to that post. And I really like how this is seated in here now. All right, next I chose the taller gummies and I put them on the ESC and the flight controllers. And the taller gummies are nice because they do give you a lot of wiggle room. For this frame, I needed M3 30 millimeter screws and that gives me just enough clearance. All right, next up, we've got to solder the Express LRS 2.4 gigahertz receiver onto the flight controller. And right at the back here is a convenient port. Port one is right here. We got T1, R1, ground and five volt. Perfect. Now, remember, TX to RX, RX to TX, not 
T to T and R to R. If you don't do that, then you won't get any receiver input in Betaflight. Next up, we're gonna connect the Walksnail video transmitter and it's got a convenient, what I call a DJI port here that's pinned out perfect for your Vista, for Walksnail 2, for even the O3 air unit to get the 10 volt back activator. We're just gonna bridge these two pads here. Now the 10 volt back is rated for 1.5 amps, which does have some people concerned that it's not gonna be enough power for things like the O3 air unit. T-Motor has addressed this by stating that the amp rating on the spec sheet is actually a very conservative one and that you should have no trouble whatsoever running the O3 air unit. They even include a cable in the box. Next, I wanna bridge the pit pad because I intend to use the VTX pit mode option in beta flight. So you're gonna find that right here next to the Bluetooth module on the flight controller. I had a weird issue with getting any power at all to my video transmitter. My Walksnail VTX just wouldn't even turn on. And this was strange because I broke out my multimeter, I checked my connections, I tried direct soldering to the flight controller, Everything looked fine at the FC and the connector, so I couldn't figure out why this thing wasn't coming on. So on the advice of T-Motor Support's help, I tried a Cadex Vista to see if that would power up, and that didn't either. So the fix for this was really simple. I just had to remove this T4 diode here on the flight controller right above the Velox F7 logo. And this is something we're gonna call it reviewer's curse because it happened in just a few of the pre-release versions of this flight controller, which I received. Removal of this diode is not something that you should have to deal with when you buy it. Next, you solder the motors. These are some of the Velox V3, and this is the complete product. It doesn't really matter what order you put the wires in, but I soldered them straight on because we're just gonna correct the direction in beta flight anyway. Finally, it's that moment. It's time to put the top plate on and then plug in a battery and see if we get those sweet beep tones. Finally, we can do the Betaflight setup. Now, this is not meant to be a complete Betaflight tutorial, but a general look at sections that will help you to complete the build and give you what I chose to configure on my setup. It's the very first thing that I would do after seeing that it connects to Betaflight normally and kind of taking a look at the setup screen is to go straight to the update firmware button. Update yourself to 4.5.1. It will come with 4.4.3. When you go to click flash firmware, it's gonna ask you to create a backup. Then it will proceed to go ahead, initiate the bootloader, erase it, and flash you to the newest version. It's going to give you this warning here that there are problems with the configuration. We go to presets, then we're going to go to load backup in the presets section, choose that file that we saved, and then it's going to reapply the backup, reset all the configuration up for the flight controller again. Brief look at the ports tab. We have UR1, if you remember, we soldered our receiver to that, so that is set to serial RX. On the walk snail, that's on port two, so we have that configured for MSP, and in the peripheral section, we have VTX, MSP, and DisplayPort. One of the reasons in this video I encourage an upgrade to 4.5.1 is because it allows you to use the motor reorder feature. I tried it with the version of the firmware that came with it, and it wasn't working. This is an awesome feature. It's gonna allow you to set the individual uh, direction of each motor. I had to reverse motors two and three in my set up and this tool just makes it so easy. It's got the visual guide to show you what way they should be turning and you can test it here with the props off. Let's talk tune and what we're running. So I've got DShot 600 set. This is an F7 flight controller. So you can run DShot 600 and then under configuration, set the gyro update frequency to 8K, 8K for your PID loop. Now from this point, you could either fly it as it is, or you could do what I love to do with any of my five inch builds. The Superfly Freestyle five inch preset is awesome. I would highly recommend giving it a shot. I use it on all of my new five inch builds and, and I kind of just go from there. It's a really, really great starting point. And this quad is set up for it. You can choose your rates, click pick, it says it only works with either D-Shot 600 or 300, but you are good to go. We just set 8K, 8K, and 600, and then boom, you are ready to go and fly this thing with an awesome starting point, in my opinion. 
Well, I think that's a wrap for this video. If you have any questions about the T-Motor Velox F7 flight controller or an ESC stack, let me know down in the comments below. If you got the stack and you're getting on with it well, or you're not, I also want to hear from you. As always, you guys have a great day. I'm going to go do some flying, and you guys take care.